You're listening to Amy Keeps It Creepy, the podcast where I share my obsession with true crime and the paranormal with you. I'm your host, Amy Brooks. A zombie car wash, iron crotch kung fu, an alligator gender reveal party. This is the creepy news stories of 2020 episode. Happy New Year's, Creepsters. I wish you all health and happiness in 2021. And I wish you luck with your New Year's resolutions. Statistically, most people last a month. But a new study suggests that January 19th is actually the universal date people fall off the resolution wagon. Hmm. I usually make it to February, but I am hopeful this year that I can persevere. Can I make it or... Am I lying to myself? Probably lying to myself, but just a little. Lie to me a little, right? Here are my three resolutions for 2021. One, do so much Pilates that it actually justifies wearing my black leggings every day. Two, stop swearing. It's a bad habit. I don't swear in public, but at home, I have a bit of a potty mouth. And baby C is going to learn some choice four-letter words this year if I don't improve my vocab. Mommy? He's a f- nut. Yeah, can't have that. And lastly, stop doom scrolling on my news feed. The news is depressing these days, unless it's creepy news. I find it entertaining. I am obsessed with creepy news. And you can obsess with me. Today is our first annual creepy news stories of the year episode. Yay. And trust me, 2020 had some good ones. So kick back and have some hot tea. Because I know you are all giving up that rosé, at least until January 19th. And let's review the creepiest news 2020 had to offer. I'm on Instagram, at Creepy Podcast, and my personal account is at Miss Amy Brooks. You can also find the Amy Keeps It Creepy page on Facebook. And if you want to be creepy with me in 2021, please leave a review and subscribe to Amy Keeps It Creepy on Apple Podcast or wherever you podcast so you never miss an episode. It's hard to ignore COVID stories in the news because (laughs) that's been our lives this year. In my hometown in LA, someone is dying every 10 minutes of COVID. We get it. We all know that the ice trucks lining the streets aren't filled with frozen pizzas. It's a real life horror show. So heads up, I am not reviewing the mainstream, depressing news stories in this episode. Initially, I planned on avoiding COVID stories altogether, but then I found some creepy COVID news stories to share with you. A man was spotted using a live snake as a makeshift mask on a public bus in England. (laughs) The unidentified man was taking the bus from Swinton to Manchester with the snake wrapped around his neck when another passenger snapped a photo of the bizarre moment. I posted it on creepypodcast.com. Check it out. The creepy dude truly had a snake as a face mask. A passenger said she first believed the man was only wearing a funky mask until the reptile started slithering over the handrails. (laughs) No one on the bus seemed to be bothered by the incident. However, authorities have said a snake is not a proper face covering during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, authorities. Production company Kawagara Sate, roughly translated as Scare Squad, has launched a drive through haunted house in Tokyo. Unlike a traditional haunted house where guests can flee if frightened, customers are confined to their cars and cannot escape the horrors during the 13-minute performance. With no actual contact between the audience and performers, the risk of transmitting the virus is virtually eliminated. And of course, inside their cars, customers can scream as loudly as they like. And that's fine by me because every time I've gone to a haunted house, I have been touched. One time when I was 15, I was at Not Scary Farm and a guy wearing a Freddy Krueger mask squeezed my boobs. Yeah, so charming. Once the horror is over... Instead of eating brains, these helpful zombies actually clean the blood off the cars they attacked just minutes earlier. (laughs) The zombies clean the car. 
That's hysterical. Are they still in character for the cleaning? Because that would be entertaining having the undead wash your car. A man found a caterpillar on his broccoli that he purchased at his local Tesco. Darliston, who is a host on Kiss FM UK, was shocked at first. But that feeling soon turned to joy when he realized he had a new pet to enjoy during the lockdown in his London home. When he went to the market for a replacement broccoli, he had given the other broccoli to his new friend. He was overjoyed to find five more caterpillars. <laughs> and then his roommate had a caterpillar on his broccoli as well. Okay, what is up with the broccoli at Tesco? So altogether, the man raised seven caterpillar children to maturity in a deluxe caterpillar pad that he built. Brock, Ollie, Carlos, Croc, Janine, and Slim Eric started to have romances and hooking up. Some would be spotted dancing together. Of course, the guy posted all of this on his social media and got a little too into his caterpillar's dating life. His family found the whole thing quite odd, you think? And his mother stopped eating at his house. Yeah, it's gross. In the end, they matured and became butterflies. A mythical mermaid monster from Japanese folklore has made a resurgence in the country's pop culture as people hope for the end of the coronavirus. Amabi is a 19th century Japanese spirit known as yokai, who was said to ward off plagues. According to legend, Amabi was said to have appeared to a samurai and told him to draw a picture of her and show it to people to keep them safe from the coming pandemic. The fishy, long-haired, bird-like yokai has inspired everything in Japan this year. From cakes and noodles to beauty products and hand sanitizers. She's kind of cute. She even sparked the Omabi challenge on Twitter that urged people to draw her. And many people did, including a sea lion at a zoo. It's true, I saw the picture. Very talented sea lion indeed. While some yokai are evil spirits, others like Omabi are said to have benevolent powers and are well loved in Japan. Another kind spirit yokai, known as Tofu Kozo, morphs into the form of a child, follows people home, and offers them tofu. Kind of creepy. The mayor of a town in Peru posed as a dead coronavirus victim by lying in a coffin while wearing a face mask to avoid being arrested for violating lockdown rules that he should have been helping enforce. Jamie Rolando Urbino Torres was out partying with friends when he allegedly played dead to throw cops off, who arrived to bust him for defying public health orders amid the pandemic. He was so busted. The mayor, who has already faced criticism for being absent so much of the time during the outbreak, is shown in a photo released by local police lying in a coffin with his eyes closed. And yes, it's posted on creepypodcast.com. It wasn't immediately clear where he and his pals were drinking or why open caskets were nearby. There is the story. <laughs> That's quite a night of drinking that ends up amongst coffins. Torres has also come under fire by officials for failing to open emergency quarantine shelters and failing to implement safety checks. Lovely. He may not be dead, but his political career certainly is. A town in England used Oregon's exploding whale incident to teach a lesson about the importance of social distancing. Do you know this one? I love this story. It's old news, but I love it, so I'm going to repeat it. The Doncaster Council shared the tale of a sperm whale that died and washed ashore near the city of Florence, Oregon in November 1970. City officials attempted to blow up the 45-foot, 8-ton mammal a plan that went horribly wrong. At the time, the Oregon State Highway Department decided to use 20 cases of dynamite to disintegrate the mammal. They believed seagulls and other scavengers would clean up any remains. Uh-huh. A military veteran at the scene vehemently warned officials against using so much dynamite, and the official in charge admitted he wasn't quite sure how much would be enough. Hmm. But the plan went ahead anyway. The effort attracted a large crowd of spectators. Officials moved the onlookers back about a quarter of a mile for safety and set off the dynamite. The onlookers were covered in a downpour of whale blubber. Pieces soared and a large chunk crushed the roof of a car, though no one was hurt. When you ignore expert advice and act like an idiot... 
you cover everyone else with decaying whale blubber, the council in England tweeted and its coronavirus pandemic analogy. Not only was everyone covered in blubber, but the whale largely remained intact. Scavengers wouldn't touch the carcass. Officials spent the rest of the day burying it on the beach. The problem hadn't gone away, only now there were thousands of bits of problem spread for miles around. The council said, alluding to how the coronavirus could spread if social distancing was in practice. The council's final point was that everyone should stay home and let nature take its course. Sometimes it's just better to sit at home and do nothing than go outside and do something ridiculous, the council said. Sage advice. Here are some creepy people news stories for you. A man accused of serial pooing in public has quit his managerial job after a photographer caught him relieving himself on a suburban Brisbane street. (laughs) And yes, go to creepypodcast.com to view that gem of a photo. Andrew Douglas McIntosh has been dubbed the poo jogger. McIntosh was photographed doing the deed outside while clutching toilet paper, and has been charged with one count of public nuisance. (laughs) He even brought his own TP. He totally planned it. What a creepy dude. It is alleged that McIntosh, 64, fouled on the private footpath of an apartment block near his Brisbane home 30 times last year. Ew. The regularity of McIntosh's movements proved to be his undoing with a resident setting up cameras to catch him in the act. Oh, they were so sick of the poo. Someone has to clean that up. With his reputation destroyed, I could make a toilet pun right now, but I won't. McIntosh has since stepped down from his job as a quality care manager at Avio, a company that runs retirement villages. Avio later confirmed his resignation as pictures of McIntosh mid-motion went viral around the world. Oh, did I mention Macintosh is also on Brisbane City Council's Brisbane Board, which advises on community issues associated with development and planning. It's unclear whether he resigned from that position, but I'm guessing he has. Serial pooers are a thing. A close family member of mine who is in the Navy told me about it. He hated being on night patrol because inevitably, whoever was on duty would end up meeting a random poo on the deck from the ship's serial pooer. I had never heard of anything like that, and I kind of wish I hadn't. Okay, there's another serial pooer that was caught last year, though, so I'm going to share it with you. Andrea Grosher, 51, was caught with eight counts of wanton destruction of property after a Natick, Massachusetts police officer said he saw her defecating outside the Natick outdoor store around 7 a.m. Wow, broad daylight. The poo jogger in Australia pooed at night. Police were first alerted to the serial pooer when the store owner reported human feces there on eight separate occasions. I guess she had a favorite spot. Police began investigating, initially believing it might be an animal, but then found toilet paper and other wipies. (laughs) Wipies. She came prepared as well. Totally planned. Do these creepy serial pooers get some kind of thrill from this? They must. An officer was patrolling the parking lot when he spotted Grocer waiting for the lot to clear, opening the driver's side of her Lincoln MKX and defecating out the door. Grocer was pulled over after driving off and told police that she was on her way home up the street where she worked as a nanny. (laughs) Oh, great. But she stopped because she has irritable bowel syndrome. Her horrified employers <laughs> told police, however, that Grocer had access to their restroom. This, coupled with the length of time that passed with Grocer in the lot, led to her arrest. Her mugshot is classic. It's one of, gotta be one of the funniest that I have ever seen. I posted it on the website creepypodcast.com. She has the most horrifying look on her face. Like she just got caught crapping in a mall parking lot. Two men snuck into a bedroom with machetes after being hired to carry out a stranger's sexual fantasy of being tied up in his underwear and stroked with a broom. Only the house they broke into to complete this task was the wrong address. Oh dear. 
The pair from Sydney, Australia, made their apologies and left the startled victim's bedside as soon as they realized their mistake. Yeah, I bet they were so fast out of there. Police said the intended client had a history of proclivity for engaging the services of people. He had made arrangements with a man on Facebook for people to engage in the role play and sent his address before he later updated it after moving more than 30 miles away. What did he forget that he offered a creepy dude on Facebook five grand to be stroked with a broom handle? Hmm, I think I would have remembered that. And where exactly did the machete come into play? That seems like a step up from broom handle. The resident of the home where the men mistakenly turned up to told police that when he noticed a light on in his lounge around 6.15 a.m., he assumed it was his friend who visits daily to make coffee. That's a nice friend. He said he called out, it's too early. After hearing a voice asking, is your name Kevin? <laughs> the man said he turned his light on to see two men he did not recognize standing next to his bed, both holding machetes. Not a broom in sight. A conversation then ensued, yeah, you think? In which the pair repeatedly sought to establish whether he was Kevin each time being told no in response. (laughs) At one point, one of them asked, are you sure you're not Kevin? We were told to come to this address and pick up Kevin. Eventually accepting their error, the duo then left with one saying, sorry, mate, and shaking the resident's hand (laughs) while the other said bye. The resident then called police. Well, at least they were polite about it. Okay, I knew this guy from my acting class that TMI told me he was an escort. He was going over lines for a scene with me, and he just blurted out this story to me. He had this client that would pay him $1,000 to walk barefoot on snails. Oh my God, couldn't believe he told me that. And he did it often. The client would immediately climax from the sound of the crunching snails. Oh, so creepy. I know way too many things. Jenna Evans was on a high-speed train that was racing down the tracks, her fiancé by her side, when some bad guys appeared. There was only one way to protect her three-carat diamond engagement ring. Swallow it. So that's what Evans did. I popped that sucker off, put it in my mouth, and swallowed it with a glass of water, Evans said in a Facebook post. Then she woke up. Evans was relieved in the morning that the whole episode had just been a vivid, bizarre dream that was very James Bond. That is, until she realized her engagement ring was no longer on her finger. Evans, who has a history of sleepwalking, soon realized that while the bad guys and the high-speed train had all been her snoozing subconscious, the consumption of her engagement ring was not. When I woke up in the morning, there was no ring on my finger, Evans exclaimed. I couldn't help but laugh at it. And then I had to wake up my fiancé and tell him that I had swallowed my engagement ring. (laughs) I wonder how that conversation went. Evans went to an urgent care clinic where doctors decided against letting the ring pass naturally through the 29-year-old system and instead revert her to a gastroenterologist. Yeah, three carats is a big diamond. Diamonds cut glass. Imagine what one would do to your insides. I waited a long time for that engagement ring, and I will marry Bobby Howell, damn it, Evans wrote. Doctors found the engagement ring in Evans' intestines, just beyond her stomach. Evans said her fiancé returned the ring to her. Bobby finally gave me my ring back this morning. I promise not to swallow it again. We're still getting married, and all is right in the world. There's great news, IKEA shoppers. Thanks to a new print ad, you can find out if you're pregnant and discover a discount on a crib. It sounds like a wonderfully pragmatic deal until you find out the catch. You actually have to pee on the ad to find out said discount. The ad, which ran in a Swedish magazine called Amelia, uses the same kind of technology as an at-home pregnancy test. And when someone pregnant pees on it, a discounted price on the Sudvik crib model magically appears. It's cool that the ad provides a free pregnancy test and all. I saw a picture of the ad. It's posted on creepypodcast.com. But it does not mention how one would actually go about getting the discount at the IKEA store. Do you have to physically present a 
urine-soaked ad to a cashier. Hmm. A high school class ring lost in Maine in 1973 has been found buried beneath a forest floor in Finland and returned to its owner, who says the unlikely find might be more than just a coincidence. Dubber McKenna, 63, lost the Morse High School ring in a Portland department store shortly after her then-boyfriend and future husband, Sean, gave it to her when he left for college. The ring, however, was largely forgotten until a sheet metal worker found it with a metal detector under eight inches of soil in a Finnish forest last month after 47 years. The story of how the ring journeyed nearly 4,000 miles from Maine to Finland remains a mystery. McKenna believes the sudden discovery of the ring may be a message from her late husband. Sean used to say there were no such things as coincidences, she said. He's telling me to get my act together, to get going with the rest of my life. Wow, there's got to be an easier way for the dead to communicate with us. An Illinois man recently celebrated the 60th anniversary of the day he confiscated then-Vice President Richard Nixon's unfinished sandwich on September 22, 1960, when the politician was visiting his hometown of Sullivan to give a speech. He has kept the sandwich ever since. The Buffalo Barbecue Sandwich has gotten Steve Jen invited on several TV shows. He even co-wrote a book about the sandwich that got published, guys. It's published. If I don't get a book deal and this dude seriously got a book deal over an old sandwich, I'm going to be pissed. Gene, who was 14 at the time, says that his school let out early on the day of Nixon's visit and his Boy Scout troop was enlisted to help with the event. His post was right behind the vice president at the park where he was served the sandwich as lunch before his speech. He took a couple bites and commented how tasty, how good it was, Gene said. I looked around and thought, if no one else was going to take it, I'm going to take it. (laughs) What a creepy little kid. Gene brought the sandwich home to his understanding mother and asked her to preserve it. And so she did. She put it in a jar and stuck it in the freezer. It stayed there until he moved out and put the sandwich in his own freezer. So did he tell his fiancée about the sandwich before they got married? Because that goes in the full disclosure category. You have the right to know just how creepy the guy is that you're about to marry. Gene has no plans to get rid of the leftovers anytime soon. As long as I am living, that sandwich will be stored in my freezer in a container that is labeled, Save, Don't Throw Away. Wang Li Tao is no ordinary kung fu master. The 65-year-old from a village in central China practices a rather unique and excruciating-looking branch of martial arts coined Iron Crotch Karate. This is a thing, guys. Its most famous techniques involve a steel plate-capped log, six and a half feet or two meters in length, and weighing 88 pounds or 40 kilograms, that swings through the air and smashes into a man's crotch. Oh, my God. When you practice Iron Crotch Kung Fu... As long as you push yourself, you will feel great, said Wang, head of the Juton Martial Arts Academy. Wang, who has been practicing the technique for around half a century, has two children of his own. He insists that with the correct methods and sufficient practice, it does not hurt and has no effect on fertility. It has been practiced in Wang's village for the past 300 years and was historically a fiercely guarded secret. However, Concern has grown that fewer and fewer people were taking it up and it might not survive. There were once around 200 people regularly practicing in the village, said Tang. But now there were just over 20. Hmm, why do you think that may be? That's why Wang and his fellow masters started to actively promote their style of kung fu, adopting the swinging log device to demonstrate the iron crotch technique where previously villagers had just kicked, punched, or used bricks or sticks. Their efforts have gained them several new students in cities across the country who learn using social media or custom-made videos posted online. I can only imagine how you practice Iron Crotch Kung Fu by yourself online without the swinging log device, but I guess you can leave it to your imagination or not. A famous author in France known as a serial killer expert divulged that most of his life and work are 
stake, including the murder of his non-existent wife. I have reached the moment of coming clean. My lies have weighed me down, says 67-year-old Stéphane Bourgeois. Sometimes I make films in my head. An online investigation from an anonymous forum discovered his lies. This guy was pretty successful. His name was attached to more than 40 crime books. He had claimed that he interviewed more than 70 serial killers. Describing himself as a mythomaniac. Ooh, new word, I like it. Mythomaniac. I'm totally using that. He admitted he had no training with the FBI, never interviewed Charles Manson, and not played professional soccer for the Parisian team Red Star. Mm -hmm. The story of his fake wife was based on Susan Bickrest, who he fleetingly knew before serial killer Gerald Stano murdered her in Florida in 1975. It was bull that I took on, he said. I didn't want people to know the real identity of someone who was not my partner, but someone who I had met five or six times in Daytona Beach and who I liked. He confessed his lies were driven by his desire to be popular. I am profoundly and sincerely sorry. I am ashamed of what I did. It's absolutely ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I call BS. Total lies. Did he really know a murder victim of an infamous serial killer? I think it's more mythomaniasm. Chinese street barber Xiong Gaowu deftly scrapes a straight razor along the inside of his customer's eyelid. Yes, you heard that correctly. You should be gentle, very, very gentle, said Xiong, who performs traditional eyelid shaves at his roadside location in Chengdu. Customers swear by the practice of blade wash eyes, saying they trust Xiong's skill with the blade. Oh my God, the photos are horrific. They are posted on creepypodcast.com. The blade literally looks like a dirty, dull scraping tool. Nothing you want near your eyes. No, it's not dangerous, said a 60-year-old customer. My eyes feel refreshed after shaving and I feel comfortable. Young, 62, said he learned the technique in the 1980s and serves up eight customers a week. It was difficult at the beginning, but it became a piece of cake afterwards, he said. So who did he practice on? That's crazy. There always has to be a first customer for the eye shave. The technique appears to unblock moisturizing sebaceous glands along the rim of the eyelid. Patients will feel their eyes are dry and uncomfortable when the glands are blocked. When he is shaving, it's most likely that he is shaving the openings of these glands. While customers insisted their eyes felt better after a shave, onlookers cringe at the sight of Xiong wielding his razor. I think I'll stick with the eye drops. Police in Maryland investigating reports of a casket photographed bobbing up and down in a river discovered the object was something far less macabre. A rectangular object with flat sides and a curved top was seen floating in the South River a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay near Annapolis. People were horrified. The concrete slab resembling a coffin sparked complaints of a possible biohazard in the water. Authorities were dispatched to the river, where a hydrographic operations team helped pull what turned out to be a floating dock from the water. It really looked like a coffin, though. You have to see the footage. It was really creepy. Which leads us to our next segment, my favorite segment. Creepy Corpse News. Police in Gainesville, Florida, are investigating after a contractor doing work on a home discovered half a dozen jars containing human tongues inside a crawl space beneath the residence. Oh. Police were dispatched to a home after receiving a 911 call that human remains dating back to the 1960s had been found in a crawl space of a home belonging to the ex-wife of Dr. Ronald A. Bogman. Once on the scene, investigators found half a dozen plastic gallon-sized jars containing human tongues. <laughs> oh, God, so gross. Bogman, a world-renowned pathologist and former University of Florida professor, had obtained the specimens as part of his research and brought them home with the intention of using them for additional work. Yeah, tell me that's not creepy. What, seriously, was he going to do with them at home? He stored them in the crawl space because it was a cool area. I guess his wife didn't want it in the fridge. 
The tongues used for research on thyroid and neck conditions were meant to be brought back to the university. I guess he conveniently forgot. Bogman's ex-wife now owns the home and also forgot that the jars were beneath the house. I don't know what the policies and laws would have been like 50 years ago or whatever it was, but I can tell you that today, that's not something that would be permitted, a University of Florida spokesperson said. And this is why (laughs) I will not donate my body to science. I don't want to end up floating in a jar, forgotten in some creepy crawl space. There are very strict federal and state laws, as well as universal policies that prohibit that. It would be neither appropriate or legal for a faculty member or researcher to bring something like that home. The university spokesperson continued to say that while the call is uncommon, it's not unheard of because of the location of the university. (laughs) What does that mean? What's going on at the university? Police do not suspect any foul play and are conducting tests on the specimens. It was not immediately clear how many tongues were found, but one jar contained several. Ew. A man found a decomposed body in a freezer while clearing out his dead mother's New York City apartment. The body was found in a chest freezer that had been sealed with duct tape. Classic. Investigators said the body appeared to have been stored for at least 10 years. The body was so decayed that authorities couldn't determine its sex. Authorities are investigating the body's identity and whether it could be the dead woman's mother. Oh, wow, the guy's grandmother? What did he think happened to his grandmother? Did she, like, disappear? He didn't go to the funeral? There is so much more to this story. The deceased tenant reportedly never gave permission for work to be done on the apartment. Yeah, she didn't want anyone in her apartment to find her dead mother in the freezer. She seemed like a lovely lady, always very pleasant, the landlord said. It's a shock. Uh Uh-huh. It's always the nice, quiet ones, isn't it? A worker at a New Jersey cemetery, Hillside Cemetery, New Jersey, where, incidentally, Joey Ramone, the lead singer of the Ramones, is buried, was trapped for nearly half an hour after a grave collapsed on him while he was measuring it. Oh my God. The unidentified 59-year-old gravedigger was working when the sides of the eight-foot-deep grave caved in, pinning him up to his knees in grave dirt. They did not utilize any shoring when they were digging the grave, but he decided to jump in nevertheless. His pleas for help were heard by co-workers, who called a rescue team to free him from this situation. Have you guys ever heard of taphophobia? It's described as an irrational fear of being buried alive. Not so irrational when you are jumping in open graves for a living. A Pennsylvania woman was arrested for allegedly keeping her dead grandmother. Another dead grandmother in the freezer story. Oh my God. Well, this grandmother was in there for 15 years while the family continued collecting her social security checks. The grandmother, Glenora Recker Delahaye, died in March 2004 in Ardmore, about 10 miles northwest of Philadelphia. She was 97. So what, Social Security thought they were paying out to a woman who was 113 years old? Dang. Well, I guess the oldest lady to live died at 122. That lady from France, but 113, that's old. Delahaye's 61-year-old granddaughter, Cynthia Carolyn Black, allegedly told police she kept her grandmother's corpse because the family needed the money from her Social Security checks. She had even moved houses once, bringing the freezer with her, a hundred miles away. Oh my God. Police only found the dead woman because someone had called and turned her in. Oh man, I bet it was the movers. They had to have been suspicious of the freezer with the mysterious contents. And why did they have to keep the body in a freezer to collect the checks? Did they think that they could just thaw out grandma should anyone become suspicious? Black is facing charges of abuse of a corpse, theft by unlawful taking, and receiving stolen property. Police at a Munich airport got a surprise during their search of a wooden box being transported by a 74-year-old passenger 
that turned out to contain the bones of the woman's dead husband. Customs officials, a doctor, and prosecutors were called in, and they determined no crime had been committed. After questioning the woman and her 52-year-old daughter, police learned the pair were on their way from Greece back to their native Armenia via Munich and Kiev. The mother said her husband died in 2008 and was buried in Greece, and that she and her daughter decided to bring his remains home to a final resting place in Armenia. So they dug up his bones? (laughs) That's not easy to do. Following the short investigation, the two women were allowed to continue on their journey with the boxed remains. Oh, man. They didn't know what to do with those ladies and the box of bones. They totally just let them go. Authorities in Detroit are investigating a bizarre and scary mistake. A young woman was declared dead before employees at a funeral home realized she was actually alive. Are you guys having a little taphophobia right now? I am. The fire department responded to a call about an unresponsive 20-year-old female. After 30 minutes of CPR and other measures, paramedics concluded she was dead. Because there was no indication of foul play, as per standard operating procedure, the Oakland County Medical Examiner's Office was contacted and given the medical data. No autopsy. The patient was again determined to have expired and the body was released directly to the family to make arrangements. The James H. Cole Funeral Home in Detroit says it was contacted to pick up the body. Staff at the funeral home then discovered the woman was still breathing. Holy cow, was she on the embalming table, like, ready to be embalmed? It's a nightmare. Well, it could have been worse. If they embalmed her and killed her, so creepy. I'm going to do a Buried Alive episode in the near future. There are some amazing stories that I would love to share with you. So creepy. A father and son have been charged for allegedly selling body parts on the black market they knew were contaminated with infectious diseases. Lovely. The family duo was associated with the Biological Resource Center of Rosemount in Illinois, which provided human remains donated to science to medical professionals for a fee. I told you, this is why I refuse to donate my body to science. I don't want to be messed with. I'm going straight into the crematorium. Hopefully, I won't be burned alive because of some idiot paramedic thinking I'm dead when I'm actually alive. Yikes. Although it is not illegal to dismember and sell body parts, it is against the law to knowingly sell human remains that test positive for infectious disease. Although they were accused of exposing people to infectious diseases, including HIV, hepatitis, and sepsis, no illnesses have been reported in relation to the scheme. That's good. Oxford University's Pitt Rivers Museum has removed its famous collection of shrunken heads and other human remains from a display as part of a broader effort to decolonize its collections. Our audience research has shown that visitors often saw the museum's displays of human remains as a testament to other cultures being savage, primitive, or gruesome, the museum director said. Uh, shrunken heads are pretty gruesome. Sorry, they are. The heads were mostly used for trophy, ritual, or trade. It is the definition of gruesome. The human remains have been moved into storage. Hmm, don't know how respectful that is. The museum has 2,800 human remains that remain in its care. Uh, you mean stuffed in a box labeled with a Sharpie. Polish investigators fear a pig farmer may have been devoured by his own livestock after a neighbor discovered bones on the property. Remains believed to be that of the farmer, who was said to be in his 70s, were found eight days after the man was last seen on his farm, in Lubin, a town about 260 miles west of Warsaw. It was not immediately clear how the man died. Officials suspect a heart attack or a fall, but it reportedly was clear that the pigs fed on him. The animals were said to simply roam freely through the yard, Oh, man. I hope he was dead and they didn't feed on him as he lay there dying. Oh, man. Animals can be creepy. When I lived alone, I often thought of what my animals would do if I died. It could have been a week or more before someone thought to check on me. My mind always went to my cat eating me, though. (laughs) 
I have no doubt I would have ended up as cat food for Pouncer. Here are some creepy animal news stories from 2020. Let's talk about murder hornets. A deadly species of hornets commonly found in Japan that can kill up to 50 people a year have reached the U.S. Asian giant hornets, otherwise known as murder hornets, have been very elusive to track. In Blaine, a small city on the Canadian border, at least six hornets have been sighted. One was even tagged by scientists. But the glue took too long to dry and it slid off, getting glue on the insect's wings and stopping it from flying home. Shoot. The hornets made headlines after being sighted in America last year for the first time. They're famous for being big, up to two inches long, and inflicting horrible pain with venomous stingers that can be fatal. Now, Washington State hopes to destroy their nest before the hornet's annual slaughter phase kicks in. That's when they will visit apiaries, basically mark a hive, attack it with force, removing every bee from the hive, decapitating them, killing all of the workers, and then spending the next few days harvesting the brood and the pupa out of the hive as a food source. Beekeepers who spot one are urged to call a new hive attack hotline and watch which way it goes. After all, it might be flying home. Yikes, murder hornets. And they are common in Japan? Wow, how terrifying. A North Carolina woman is shaken after a weekend encounter with an unwelcome visitor. Julie Laughlin was settling in her bed when she saw a discomforting sight. A fox slip into her home from the patio through a doggy door used by her nine-year-old beagle, Duchess. The next thing she knew, she spotted the fox's ear sweeping across the room, then up onto her bed. I don't know what else you could do, she said in an emotional interview. I mean... Maybe throw a pillow at it or throw a blanket over it. But she didn't have time to react, and the animal latched onto her foot. After prying it off, Laughlin grabbed the fox and held onto it as she called 911. I want to know what happened to this chick's beagle. Where the hell was Duchess? What a useless dog. I know Boo Boo, my Pomeranian, would have barked or at least given the fox a disapproving look or something. Right on my bed, I've got my hand around his neck, she said to the dispatcher in her call. She held on to the fox for 12 minutes, at which point police arrived, broke down her patio door, and removed the fox. I was praying that I would live, she now says. The fox did turn out to have rabies, and Laughlin has since had to undergo a battery of shots, including a rabies vaccine. This is the eighth confirmed rabies case in Greensboro this year. Oh, rabies shots terrify me. In the 80s, they used to give rabies shots with this massive needle in your stomach. Total horror show. My mom would say, Amy Marie, stay away from the, you know, whatever adorable little wild animal. You don't want to get a shot in the stomach, do you? And it always worked. I never went around wild animals. Now they administer it in the arm. Seems a lot more civilized. A California teen was taking a nap in a chair in the backyard of her home in Sierra Madre. That's not too far from me in Burbank. When suddenly, she awoke to the sound of a bear approaching her. It immediately attacked, clawing at her arm and leg, biting her. That's when the teen managed to grab her laptop lying nearby and started smacking the bear with it. She was able to safely run inside. The attack was 100% unprovoked, and there was no food outside that could have attracted the bear. Yeah, except for her, she was the food. It was bloodthirsty. What a brave girl. Can you imagine waking up to a bear attacking you? Oh, man. Fish and wildlife are now trying to find the bear, which has been described as being a light-colored juvenile weighing about 125 pounds. The bear that attacked the teen will be euthanized if it's captured. It's unfortunate, but once an animal tastes human blood, they view humans as prey. I guess we taste delicious. Flocks of black vultures are roosting on roofs and in trees in one Pennsylvania town, causing damage to homes and property and generally harassing residents. Oh, creepy. Flocks of vultures. Actually, a group of vultures is referred to a wake of vultures. Yes, a wake. I looked it up. 
I have this book called An Exaltation of Larks, which tells you the proper name for each group species. Tell me I'm not a nerd. It's a cool book, though. The birds, which have wingspans of up to five feet, one and a half meters, are protected under federal laws. The birds peck at the rubber on the roofs and target plastic things like porch furniture and garbage cans for destruction. Wait, I thought vultures ate dead flesh. They eat roofs? Roofs are expensive. I know they are protected, but I might pop off a few shots for my kid's BB gun to get them away from my house. It can't be a good omen to have vultures mulling around. (laughs) One time, I came home and there was a dead bird on my welcome mat. It freaks me out. Seems like a really bad omen, right? And it also reminded me of my creepy stalkers, who used to bring me dead animal presents. Isn't that nice? A story for another day, but I'll tell you my stalker stories someday. They're good. Ooh, I've got some creepy ones. The best way to get rid of the birds is to harass them back, said the Pennsylvania director with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Wildlife Services Department. (laughs) That's a mouthful. Residents are banging on pots and pans and lighting fireworks to disrupt the birds. They should try a BB gun. Not to kill them, but, you know, a little shot in the vulture butt and they're out of there. Or maybe not. Maybe they got pissed off. Never piss off a wake of vultures. Hanging effigies, as in taxidermied birds, also deters the vultures. But they are expensive and residents must get permission to display them. Permission from whom? Complaints about the birds who appear menacing as they perch on eaves and line tree branches have been ongoing for at least a decade. Yikes. I think it's time to move. If only you could sell your house filled with a wake of vultures. I love this next headline. A man uses live alligator for his baby gender reveal party. What could possibly go wrong? Grandmother-to-be Melody Kilbert posted a video to Facebook featuring her son, an alligator wrangler and trainer who goes by the name T-Mike the Gator King. First thing that came to my mind when my girlfriend and I decided to have a gender reveal party were alligators. Kielbert, whose father and grandfather were both also alligator handlers, said, They're a big part of our family, so why not incorporate them into our reveal? At one point in the video, Clybert places a watermelon into the gator's mouth. The reptile snaps her jaw shut and a blue liquid comes gushing out of her mouth, indicating that Clybert's baby is going to be a boy. Wow, that's drama. Oh, we have a few gators who like to eat fruit, so I figured fruit was great. Let's get a watermelon, drill a hole in it, add some jello to it, and throw it in the gator's mouth. Let her bust open. No big deal, you know, Clybert explained. And what better way to do it than having an alligator that is 61 years old that my grandfather hatched in 1957? All righty. Clybert said the gator in the video is named Sally, and she's our movie gator. She appeared in commercials and the TV show American Horror Story. Sally's not just a gator. She's not just a pet. She's part of our family, he said. The viral video has more than 5 million views on Facebook. It ultimately made its way onto other people's social media platforms like Twitter, where many people express concern for the animal's well-being. Why? Because the gator had a jello shot? I'm more concerned about the little babies hanging out around Sally. Clybert said he had prepared for numerous scenarios in which things could have gone wrong. I know gators better than the back of my own hand, he said, noting that Sally had opportunities to hurt him in the video but didn't. He added that there were a dozen other gator handlers on the scene. Most of my family are gator handlers. Those handlers include his pregnant girlfriend, Rebecca Miller, who has been a gator handler for four years, and his nine-year-old son, Blaze. It's like having our family brought up on the dairy farm, he explained, except with gators. Well, there you go. Residents of a house in Dunan, Queensland, were stunned to discover a brown tree snake resting on top of the toilet's electronic flush mechanism inside the wall of the toilet. That is my new phobia. Snakes spying on me when I'm on the toilet, ready to bite me. Yikes. The toilet had been flushing by itself randomly for days when they opened it up and found a surprise waiting for them. Brown tree snakes are mildly venomous. 
They're not even considered dangerous to an adult human, and no deaths have occurred. But do you really want one biting your bits with its mild venom? Oh, Australia, I love you, but your animals terrify me. A suspect accused of stealing a small shark from the San Antonio Aquarium and smuggling it out in a baby carriage was charged with felony theft, according to authorities. Anthony Sinclair Shannon, 38, was arrested and charged with felony theft of property valued at $30,000 for the heist of Miss Helen, a horn shark. The 16-inch long female shark was notably snatched on the last week of Shark Week, the Discovery Channel's popular annual week-long programming dedicated to the species. Oh man, Shark Week brings out the worst in people. They get crazy into it. Security video released shows the three thieves walking through the aquarium while pushing a baby carriage. They then snagged the horn shark from an interactive touch pool while an attendant was busy assisting other visitors. Their shark nappers then slipped into a filter room and emptied out a beach bucket where they placed Miss Helen and then transferred her into the stroller and hurried up the stairs and out to the parking lot before driving away. Police easily tracked down the getaway vehicle and found a house nearby where they were able to recover Miss Helen. A bunch of geniuses. A fire on a farm in northern England was accidentally set by one of the pigs. Ooh, another creepy pig story. The pig had swallowed a pedometer worn by one of its fellow pigs to demonstrate that the animals were free range. See, I wear a pedometer just like a pig. (laughs) But after the pig excreted the pedometer, copper in its battery sparked a flame in the pig dung and dried hay bedding. The fire spread to cover over 900 square feet of the farmland before it was contained. Wow. I had no idea pigs were so dangerous. There have been gruesome killings of horses and ponies across pastures in France that have left police baffled and rural communities terrified as the mysterious slangs appear to only be growing. Up to 30 attacks have been reported in pastures across the country. Ears are cut off, eyes removed, and the animal is emptied of its blood. In many of the attacks, an ear, usually the right one, has been cut off similar to a matador's trophy in a bullring. No meat is taken from the carcasses, and some of the animals have their genitals cut away. Ugh, creepy. Many now in France are speculating whether the mutilations are a morbid rite of an unknown cult, a satanic rite, a chilling challenge relayed by social media, or copycat acts. Speculation is widespread as to how the barbaric acts, some surgical in nature, could be perpetrated without a solid knowledge of equine anatomy or on a horse in a pasture, presumably able to run away, to flee. The mutilation of horses is neither a French phenomena nor is it new. In the 1980s and 90s, hundreds of horses in Britain and in Germany were mutilated. There were also cases in France between 2014 and 2016. You see, no one mentioned aliens in any of this. It sounds like alien mutilations to me. Here are two creepy alien news stories for 2020. Dr. Young Hai Chi, an Oxford University professor, claims that extraterrestrials are breeding with human beings to produce a super species which could one day save the planet from climate change. Alien-human hybrids could already be walking among us, but we can't see them, he said. Dr. Chi openly believes there is a strong correlation between alien abductions and changes in Earth's climate. You never know, right? New details are emerging about a UFO sighting recorded by the U.S. military in the waters off of the coast of California. 16 years ago, the 2004 incident involving the Tic Tac UFO, named because it was a fast-moving white object that resembled one of the Tic Tac mints that I love. I love those mints. I like the orange ones, though. The AAVs, anomalous aerial vehicles, would descend very rapidly from approximately 60,000 feet down to approximately 50 feet in a matter of seconds. 
pilots indicated that there may have been something in the water as well. One pilot detailed a disturbance up to a size of a football field. The disturbances appeared to be 50 to 100 meters in diameter and close to round. It was the only area and type of whitewater activity that could be seen and reminded him of images of something rapidly submerging from the surface, like a submarine or a ship sinking. The disturbed area also resembles shoal water around a barely submerged reef or island. But as the pilot flew away, he could see the disturbance had cleared and seas calmed immediately. The air crew reporting on the events received a high level of ridicule about the incident. The military did not confirm nor deny any of the details in the report and had little to say about other footage. However, the former military intelligence officer who led the program indicated that there was more information the public had not yet seen. My personal belief is that there is very compelling evidence that we may not be alone, he claims. Wild. (laughs) There's so much that we aren't told. I have to say, though, I think I am in the Stephen Hawking's camp, though. He's one of my favorite people, probably the smartest person to have ever lived. And he was certain that if aliens visited us, the outcome could only be their colonization and ultimately our destruction. Evil aliens terrify me. Now for some creepy science news stories of 2020. German police are losing hope of finding out who left a box of vials on a train filled with hamster DNA. Federal police sent a bomb squad to investigate after a train driver found the styrofoam box with three vials of liquid on a local train. Forensic specialists later determined that the liquid contained genetic material from rodents. Officers had hoped to crack the case by publicizing the unusual find, but despite intense media interest, the owner has remained elusive so far. What, no one was claiming their super creepy vials of rodent DNA? Surprising. Police have already disposed of the vials as the cold chain has been broken. Heidelberg is home to several research centers, including the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. It's a mystery. God only knows what wild, weird experiments they are doing there, though. Mm -hmm. Microbes. Buried in the earth from 101.5 million years ago, back even before Tyrannosaurus rex roamed the earth, have been brought back to life by Japanese research scientists. Why, why, why? Haven't we seen this movie? It didn't end well. Researchers aboard the drill ship Joidus Resolution collected sediment samples from the bottom of the ocean 10 years ago. The samples came from 328 feet or 100 meters below the 20,000 foot depth, 6,000 meters, bottom of the ocean at the bottom of the South Pacific Jair region. That's a region in the Pacific Ocean with very few nutrients and little oxygen available for life to survive on. And the researchers were looking for data on how microbes get along in such a remote part of the world. Their results indicate that even cells found that long ago, 101.5 million years ago, are capable of waking up when oxygen and nutrients become available. Why are we messing around with extinct biology, though? Even single cell organisms, it scares me. Sir Isaac Newton, famous for developing the three laws of motion and advancing calculus, apparently had a far-out idea for how to treat the plague, also called the Black Death. Toad vomit lozenges. Yum. In addition to recommending a number of gemstone amulets against the plague, he gave detailed instructions on how to make the putrid toad vomit treatment. According to two unpublished pages handwritten by Newton, that were auctioned this year for over $83,000. Newton describes in detail how to suspend a toad by its legs in a chimney for three days until he vomits up earth and various insects in it. This vomit must be caught on a dish of yellow wax, he added. Oh, Sir Isaac Newton, you had a lot of time on your hands. After the toad dies, its body should be turned into powder, mixed with the vomit and a serum and made into lozenges and worn about the affected area. 
This treatment would drive away the contagion and draw out the poison. Sounds a bit witchy-poo, doesn't it? The toe treatment was best, but if someone was in a pinch, amulets made out of the gemstones, sapphire, or amber could also serve as antidotes. Hmm. Newton likely wrote these notes on the plague shortly after returning to the University of Cambridge in England in 1667. A man has died after being infected with an amoeba that turned part of his brain to liquid. Uh, (laughs) It is thought that he may have contracted the amoeba after being exposed to contaminated soil while potting plants. This terrifies me because I am a gardener. And I always wash my hands after gardening, but still, oh, the amoebas, they terrify me. The man arrived at an emergency department after feeling strange for two weeks. He had previously suffered from a type of blood cancer, oh, but had been in remission for over a decade. Poor guy. After being admitted, he became weaker on the right side and developed an altered mental status. He was treated for bacterial, fungal, and viral meningitis. However. His condition worsened, and he became drowsy and started to have seizures. An autopsy showed liquefactive necrosis in part of his brain. This is where injured tissue gets softer to the point where it is transformed into a paste-like mush or watery debris. The autopsy also showed the acanthamoeba species. Oh, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, most people will be exposed to acanthamoeba at some point in their lives without becoming ill. Amoebic encephalitis tends to develop in people with weakened immune systems. A more common disease to develop from acanthamoeba infection is acanthamoeba keratitis. Oh, this is an infection of the eye that can result in permanent damage to vision and blindness. I'm never leaving my house again. Are you ready for some creepy food news stories? Why not? I promise you they aren't gross ones. I mean, nothing's grosser than a canthamoeba turning a brain into a watery mush, right? Am I right? The nasty odor of durian fruit coming from a package at a Bavarian post office left six workers hospitalized and caused 60 workers to be evacuated. Twelve more postal workers received treatment for nausea. Cops and firefighters were dispatched because the package was suspected to contain a dangerous gas or a harmful substance. Nope, just durian fruit. It's the grossest fruit. The fruit smell has caused numerous evacuations globally. Described as the king of fruits across Southeast Asia, the spiky fruit has a smell that's been compared to rotten meat, sewage, and dead rats. The texture is soft and the flavor has been described as sweet. The smell comes from high levels of sulfates in the fruit. Durians are rich in nutrients, and it is believed to be excellent for improving muscle strength and blood pressure. But the sweet fruit is also high in sugar and fat. An average two-pound durian has close to 1,400 calories. That's a lot. In the U.S., you can find Thai durian in many Asian markets, and the fruit is used in everything from sweets to ice cream as well as main dishes. No thanks. Consuming placenta is nothing new. Giving birth in LA to three babies, it was offered to me. I politely declined. Dried placenta has been used in some forms of Chinese medicine for centuries. But in more recent times, thanks to celebrity trends, more women are seeking out ways to eat or ingest their own placentas following childbirth. Why? Some say human women should eat their own placentas because other mammals do. So stupid. Mammals do a lot of gross things with their secretions. Doesn't mean we should too. The hole in that argument is that the reason some animals do so in the wild is to hide the smell from prey so they aren't hunted soon after birth and their babies aren't eaten. Obviously, humans don't have the same dilemma. The other reason people are keen to consume it is for the purported health benefits. Groups which advocate the practice say can raise energy levels and help with increasing the quality of breast milk, as well as ward off postpartum depression and insomnia. The placenta is most often turned into a capsule by an external company who collect it from the hospital for you, but can also be consumed by either eating it raw or cooking it. It was offered to me raw. Yuck. So is it healthy for you? The short answer is no. 
To illustrate this, a woman last year reportedly ingested her placenta by way of dried powder and capsules. Shortly after taking the pills, her baby developed signs of respiratory distress and was transferred to the neonatal intensive care unit. As it turned out, the baby had developed a group B streptococcus bacterial infection. Testing of placenta capsules also found the same bacteria. Ew. Infection risk aside, you'd need to consume a massive amount of the hormones contained in the pills to see or feel any tangible benefits. So, new moms out there, beware of goop stories and dumb celebrities. Don't eat your placenta. Sheriff's officials say they've busted an illegal winery that was operating at a municipal sewage plant in a small North Alabama town. Ew. The county sheriff's office said in a statement it received an anonymous tip about an alcohol operation at a municipal building in the town of Rainsville. Investigators then uncovered what's described as a large-scale illegal winery inside the Rainsville wastewater treatment plant. Photos released by investigators show glass containers, buckets, a fermenting rack, and other equipment often used by people who make wine at home. The agency says officers seized a lot of illegal alcohol and arrested Alan Maurice Stifle, 62. He faces a felony charge of use of official position for personal gain and a misdemeanor charge of unlawful possession of a legally manufactured alcoholic beverage. Rainsville Mayor Roger Lidgerfield said Stifle has been suspended without pay. Stifle has been a city employee for 15 years. Okay, that's great, but shouldn't they be issuing a warning about the wine? People bought this sewage wine, oh my God. Which leads us to our last creepy story of the year. Gin brewed ants? Poop wine? Whale testicle beer flavored with the smoked dung of Icelandic sheep? This beverage collection sounds like a menu at the world's worst happy hour but it's actually part of a new exhibit at the aptly named Disgusting Food Museum in Malmo, Sweden. That is a real thing. Who knew? The museum is already famous for its peculiar culinary displays, such as maggoty cheese from Sardinia, Icelandic fermented shark flesh, and Peruvian frog smoothies. Yuck. Sorry, guys. (laughs) Maybe this is grosser than the liquefied brain story. Ugh. For the new exhibit, we have found the strangest, most interesting, and challenging alcohol types from the world, the museum director said in a statement. Some of the exhibited alcohols showcase different types of homemade alcohols going back thousands of years, while others are experimental, made by local brewers. (laughs) Local psychotic brewers. I wonder if they got a bottle of the sewer wine made in Alabama. One highlight is a Scottish beer that is the strongest beer in the world, with a staggering 55% alcohol by volume. On average, beer is usually about 4.5 alcohol by volume, but the high alcohol content isn't the weirdest aspect of this Scottish brew. The intoxicating brew is served inside a taxidermy squirrel. Yes. I have posted the photo on creepypodcast.com for your edification. It's in a squirrel. I have long been fascinated by why we humans force ourselves to overcome our dislike for acquired taste alcohols, drinks that can be intensely bitter, pungent, or otherwise unpleasant. The museum director stated, This exhibit is a dive, a deep dive into why we drink and how we started our strange relationship with spirits. Highlights include, a rice wine called Tong Sol, once used as a medicinal remedy in South Korea, which is brewed from fermented human feces. I have no words. A whale testicle beer, a seasonal product produced in Iceland, incorporates testicles that are cured according to an old Icelandic tradition, lightly salted and then smoked. And lastly, anti gin. <laughs> Anti as an A-N-T-Y. Each bottle steeped with about 62 red wood ants. It is the world's first gin brewed with insects. The ants supposedly lend sharp citrus notes to the beverage. Disgust has long been considered a universal human emotion. But while the emotion may be universal, opinions vary widely about 
what qualifies as disgusting, depending on customs, cultures, and personal tastes. What is delicious to one person can be revolting to another. Disgusting Food Museum invites visitors to explore the world of food and challenge their notions of what is and what isn't edible. Go for it, guys. If you've been there, please DM me. I have to hear your story. What a creepy news year. Please join me a year from now as I count down the creepiest news of 2021. Feel free to contact me throughout the year through the website creepypodcast.com or on Instagram at creepypodcast. If you find a creepy news story that I should earmark. I am looking forward to obsessing about true crime and the paranormal with you in 2021 on Amy Keeps It Creepy. Thanks for listening. Toxic content. Toxic.